It's good to be here in Pittsburgh, finally. Uh, my flight in Washington, D.C. was canceled twice, so I wasn't on the road for 24 hours. So the first kind of row has to kind of catch me, okay, if I fall down. And then on the last flight, the lady in front of me got arrested in, in the plane. So <laughs> it was an interesting story. Um, so yeah, welcome to, to my talk on runtime metric meets developer. And uh, before I jump into, into the vision we want to present today, I want to give a little bit of a frame that, that I'm in constantly, but maybe not all of you are. So think about continuous delivery. And I know this is a loaded term, but um, let's quickly define what I mean by that. When I talk about continuous delivery, uh, what I mean is a high velocity of change in your software. You push smaller changes more frequently, basically. You don't have three releases per year. You have maybe 50 to 60 releases per day, like Etsy, or even more than 100 releases per day, like Netflix. So this is kind of the software we're looking at within, within our vision, within our paper here at Onward. And um, this is only possible uh, due to recent advances in technology that we had, and uh, especially cloud computing. So um, I want to preface my talk with, with um, some observations we, we made in a study we did that we published this year at FSE. It's called uh, The Making of Cloud Applications. And we interviewed 25 software developers that deploy in the cloud. And uh, so if you look at here, this is me on the, on the left, and on the right, developer. So I talked to a bunch of them, and I shaved. At that time, I was, I was polite. Um, and the topic that, that I want to focus on here is we asked them, how do you, you solve problems that have occurred in production? So if something occurred in production, a performance issue or even a functional issue, how do you detect that problem and how do you solve it then? And um, what people said before is that they, they collect a bunch of metrics. The cloud is, is so full of data and it's amazing. It's, it's so easy to, to just graph what we have. And then we, we asked them, so yeah, do you, do you then look at any metrics when, when solving those problems? And uh, most of the time the answer was, actually, nah, you know, I'd rather go by intuition. And, and that was interesting to us. And, uh, but, but it kind of makes sense if we look at the issue further. And the issue usually is uh, something like this. Uh, probably a lot of you have, have seen that before. Uh, just log diarrhea. So this is something that a colleague of mine at Intel kind of coined. And it's an interesting term. We just have this stream of logs, and you just can't make sense of it. Um, to, to be more polite again, I just kind of say log overload here in the slide. So, um, and this, this is a known issue, especially if you, if you look at highly distributed systems that have to be available all the time. You collect a lot of data. So to, to make sense of them, there's a lot of state of the art. If you look at the left, we have something that open source has brought through, the Elk stack. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with that, it stands for Elasticsearch, Log Session, Kibana. And it's basically a pipeline where we can go from distributed logs to centralizing them with Logstash, storing them in Elasticsearch, and then visualizing them in, in Kibana. So this is kind of a way to mitigate this log overload problem. And another more commercial tool that developers uh, are into is New Relic, wh where you have very nice dashboards you, you look at and, and some analysis on your code and how this relates to, to production. And uh, there's a lot more. <laughs> so just to give a little bit of, of context here. And uh, those tools exist. So with the developers we asked at our study, they use those tools as, as well. But in the end, what happened was that the back and forth between what they do every day, namely write code, and, and actually looking at what's going on in, in the production of your software um, was kind of dispersed. There was a mismatch between that. So what we, suge what we suggest in our paper is something called feedback-driven development. And feedback-driven development is, is the promise that from all the data we have now that we gather in our production systems, we have to put them in, in context. And specifically, we're, we're looking at some th something we call feedback visualization and feedback prediction. And the aims of, of this is to integrate the metrics that we collect at runtime into the daily uh, developer workflow. To make metrics not something that we do reactively, not something that someone has to call us for, 
like the customer calls, or you have something in your issue tracker, or you get an alert by email. It's also something uh, that, uh, that brings metrics into context, and that's what feedback is. We consider feedback is when we get this data that we might see in dashboards and, and bring it into context in what developers work with every day, namely with code. And prediction part, that's just basically preventing bad things from happening. So in the end, those are our, our three big, big goals that we pursue in feedback-driven development. So to start with, I want to give a conceptual overview of, of what I mean by that. And we always start with code. I feel that software developers uh, in their daily life deal a lot with code. And that's what their job is about. So you start with code artifacts. At some point, though, your code is not self-contained. You just don't write code for the sake of writing code. So this, this code gets deployed in some kind of infrastructure. Uh, in a particular view, it's, it's cloud infrastructure, whatever you, you have. And this application gets used by multiple devices, multiple users. And within the usage, we can observe operations data. And don't get me wrong here. If, you, if what you see here is only logs, what we mean is just an append-only uh, collection of data. This can be metrics that you gather with New Relic or with whatever software you want to have. So it's not only logs, it's also uh, metrics such as uh, response time or CPU time. So now there's a big divide here. We have on the one side with the core artifacts that we work with every day. On the other side, we have this operations data that usually operations is looking at, operations people. So what we want to do is, is bridge the gap here a little bit and say, what if we combine this? And what we get is a feedback annotated dependency graph. So we, we abstract away from our code and get a dependency graph, which is um, a simplified AST with some more information that, that makes our code uh, clearer. And in the sense of feedback mapping, this is the graphic from, from the paper. And I'm going to go step by step into it. So again, we start with code. A very simple method uh, reads some connections and, and gives back an image. You start out with, with this AST node here, and then you, you go along in constructing your dependency graph. And uh, in, our, in our cases in the paper, the dependency graph is mostly a call graph with some, a, co a call graph plus plus. So in, in, in this sense, we get the get connections call, but we also, we also um, track the information we have on the collection connections. And we do that for all methods that we call and for all of the collections we have within our code. And then we observe what happens in production. And then we have distributed logs, we have metrics, we have different kind of data sources that we can, we can now leverage. And here, there's a feedback specification step that, that is happening. We need to, to match what, what happens in our dependency graph with what is happening in production. And the result of this is we attach distributions of data, uh, usually numeric data, to those nodes. And that's feedback mapping based on a feedback specification algorithm. And this feedback specification algorithm uh, right now is it's a bit ad hoc. It's a bit built to in, in, our, in our analysis software. And to give an example how this looks like, um, we have, we have a case study, we have a prototype that we've built uh, together with SAP. And within SAP HANA, uh, I want to show you a bit how this, this uh, concept of feedback mapping goes into feedback visualization. And this is how uh, one of their products look, looks like. Uh, they built performance, or we built performance spotter, where on the left side we see the code we work with every day, and on the right side uh, we have an abstraction of all the methods and the relative performance impact. And uh, this looks a little, bit, a little bit like a profiler, and people ask us, so what's the difference between this and a profiler? The difference is that we, we take actual performance data that people use in your production software. And this can very much differ from what you profile on your, on your local environment. And this is not restricted to, to let's say, um, the AST in general. That's why we call it a dependency graph, because we, uh, what we also did is we annotated SQL queries. So on, on the bottom here, we can see the actual 
data that is, that is related to the SQL query. And we also played around with visualization. So in this case, we have this spiral graph where the thickest kind of leaf shows us where, where the, the bottleneck is. The second thing we lo looked at is prediction. This is kind of cool. And again, this is the graphic from the paper. Uh, let's go into more detail. So we again start with code. Code is a very central part of, of uh, what we look at. And we start with the code before the code change, before new code existed. And it was very simple. You had a method called overall rating. In this method, you had a reconnection, and, and you returned that. Uh, and through the code change, um, the method got more, more complex. We added the loop. We retrieved data from somewhere. This might be a database call. This might be an API call. And what we see here is that in this dependency graph that we annotated, we have certain nodes that already have data. But we have one question mark here. And this is a loop. So we know from different executions in the past um, how get purchase rating reacted in production. We know about the, the distribution of suppliers that we had in the past. But now that we introduced this loop, we want to know what's going on. So we start with this. And what we do is we take the dependent leaves, the dependent nodes, and apply statistical inference. And this can be very different. Um, in, in this case, it's, it's a regression algorithm, uh, but it can be more complex depending on your domain. So what we do is we take those, we take those dependent nodes as parameters, and, and then this is a predicted entity. So now we have information of what was going on within that loop. And this, of course, in the end, we have to propagate up, because this code is new. It's, it's, we don't know what, what's going to be in production. So this prediction that we have has to be propagated up the dependency graph. Uh, this is a little bit abstract here, but um, I'm going to show an example. So this live feedback prediction, we build a prototype called Performance Hat. And Performance Hat is, is the name is, is inspired by the thinking hats you can put on. So, uh, you know, you can have like a man managerial hat on and you think as a manager. With a performance hat as a software developer, you, you think about performance. And this is how it look li looks like. What we do is we annotate um, method uh, definitions, method calls, and we now have actual data, actual traces, uh, actual statistics that happen in production mapped to this, this code we're calling, this code we're defining. And this is an example. I hope it's going to work right now. Uh, perfect. So now what we, we do here is we introduce a code change. And to give you a bit of context, this is an actual, actual product that is, is being developed by one of our partners in Sweden. And what they have is a kind of hip chat, Slack uh, chat system where you can log in with multiple teams and, and have your voice for IP going on. So a code change that, that they had, this is an actual code change, is where the login button didn't log in just one team they had, they logged in every team they had. So now we have some performance data, we have some actual traces, some actual logs we can work on. And what we do is we, oh, sorry. We add, we add new code to log in all the users. So we add, we add a loop here. And as soon as we save this new code, our inference algorithm kicks in. So, so we get all the users. All right, and now we log in all the users with, with a, a click of a button. And the round trip is happening, yes. And now the loop is annotated as well. And the loop is, is now our predicted entity. And here now we can, we can see the statistic of the loop and oh, I scroll away. Let's, let's go back again. So the average total time is 22 seconds. That's way too slow. And, and this now gives us a proactive measure of what our code changed will be in the future. So this is a change impact analysis of, of our small piece of code. And this was our vision that we presented in this onward paper 
Um, and of course, we're not done yet. This is, this is just the start. So there's, there's some challenges that I want to share with you. And the one challenge is confounding factors. So uh, we are in a distributed world. We live in the cloud. It's very noisy. M many things are going on. So this, uh, some of you might have seen before, that this kind of shift in performance or, or any kind of data uh, is not how actual performance data looks like. So usually, data looks like this. And it's not because of the code you introduced. It's usually because of network spikes. It's usually because the other service you rely on had a bit of a spike at that moment. So if you bring this back to the developer, what kind of, what kind of information are we conveying? Should we clean that data? Should we do some time series modeling? So I think that this is a, one of the fundamental challenges we have here. So we want to present real data, but can we convey the, the information that, that your method might not, might not be at fault completely? And how can we do that? And the other thing is we want to do real-time predictions. And I mean, as long as we have this example kind of uh, toy code, if you will, then this is no problem. But as soon as you have non-trivial programs, enterprise-sized programs, all the static analysis that is happening within our tool, with prediction, for instance, is very com computationally expensive. If you, wanna, if you predict a new entity at one point and you want to propagate it up to all the other nodes, this is very expensive computationally. And the other part is it's, it's a bit technically cha challenging. Uh, if you have a large operation and a lot of metrics are flowing in, um, we kind of look at, we're currently looking at stream processing for that. All right. And I want to leave you with a, a last outlook. Where are we going with this? And the first, the first point is, is, uh, is something that, that we see it that way. Uh, please challenge me if, if you see it differently. Uh, I do feel that this is a conservative implementation of, of what people call live programming, but not for functional kind of features, but for non-functional features. So if, if for your code change, you can, can see at, at control S, you can see what the impact will be in your runtime, then this is ki kind of live programming. And the better our models will get over time, the closer it, the, the, the prediction will be to the, the actual runtime. Um, so that's, that's actually what we're looking at right now. We're looking at impact of changes in cloud runtimes. So how does this code change that you just introduced um, kind of uh, interplace with scaling in the cloud? If you introduce a code change, will your, will your uh, cloud actually start a new instance? And what does it say about your costs? So, and it's nice to say, hey, here, this, this uh, entity is expensive. It would be nicer to just have um, refactoring built into that. So, so if you detect that, refactor that as well. And uh, I also see a bit of overlap with data-driven IDEs. And there's going to be um, the keynote talk, Modern Software is All About Data, on Friday for Onward. Um, I don't know the title, but it, it, looks, it seems kind of similar to what we do. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So uh, thank you so much for your attention. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Yes, please.